Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast, where we explore the exciting science behind heart rate variability. The material discussed in this podcast should not be taken as medical advice. Please check with your medical provider to make sure any suggestions or strategies are right for you. Visit us at the OptimalHRV.com website to learn more about the Optimal HRV app, Download a free copy of Matt's book, Heart Rate Variability, and also get show notes and additional resources around heart rate variability and its applications. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Uh, ooh, we got an episode for you today. Um, so our Dr. Dave um, is joining us, and he has brought a very special guest uh, with him. Just the conversations before we got officially started has me incredibly hungry uh, to dig in with our guest. Uh, but before uh, I start nerding out, uh, Dr. Dave Hopper, do you want to uh, introduce uh, our guest and uh, we'll, we'll get rolling? Hey, absolutely. I, so I am extremely pleased to introduce uh, Dr. David Fletcher. Um, I've, and Dr. Fletcher, as many of you already in the chiropractic community are familiar with, uh, is the president of the Chiropractic Leadership Association, I, and they I produce what I think no chiropractor should be practicing without, um, and that is the subluxation station and all the equipment that, uh, that goes with, and we will, we will be getting into all of that uh, very shortly here. Um, but Dr. Fletcher uh, also opens, uh, also hosts a, uh, a very thriving practice in uh, in Toronto, and uh, and Dr. Fletcher, are you still uh, still active with that? Yeah, there's. Well, it's first off, nice to meet you, Matt, and hi, Dave. It's great to see you again. Um, yes, uh, you know what? I keep my hand in the practice, and uh, it's it's under good control by many many others. But uh, the yes. truth is, is that the demands of of running CLA uh, really, you know take up a joyful part of my time. And, um, uh, you know, I've been doing chiropractic for a lot of decades. And as a result of that, um, I think that I can bring, I think it's important I stay, you know, relevant on the clinical side, but I think that it's been a, a, an absolute um, joyful necessity to understand the impact that HRV has uh, in a very, very significant clinical setting. And, um, and I think we can share with that today. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Dave, the first, uh, one of the first things that I wanted to ask you is, um, tell us why you got into chiropractic. And, and for some of those uh, listeners, I know I've explained what chiropractic is um, in the past, but, uh, but tell us from your perspective, because uh, you put words together so elegantly. Um, I love listening to your talks. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Dr. Fletcher, he is a keynote speaker at a and many, many major conferences. Uh, so, um, so please uh, tell us why you got into chiropractic and uh, what chiropractic is, and then how heart rate variability plays into that. I know it's a big question. Yeah, no, listen, let's, let's take a very fast uh, retrospective here. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, was like many people, I, I, I enjoyed learning as a kid. And uh, so I started university at the ripe old age of 16. And uh, I started in engineering. And I, when I, when I found out that um, I was really enjoying the math of it. I actually shifted from engineering and was in a mathematics program. I, I had visions of, I don't know, flying to the moon or something like that. But the, um, the realities were that uh, I had attended chiropractic as a, as a child uh, for various reasons. There's a whole you know, podcast on that alone as to how uh, your life can get um, uh, interrupted by things that you had never intended to. I, I was a very active child, probably ADD, ADHD, never diagnosed, but I was also a good little athlete. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, this is very brief and I'll say this, this to do it. Um, they had a wonderful school program in my, my city. I'm Canadian and it was from Winnipeg and they actually were doing scoliosis checks. And so I was checked and they found out that I had some type of misalignment process within the spine. They indicated that a chiropractor would be the right approach. And so they embarked upon this idea of straightening my spine. And it lasted about six visits. I had no attention, attention span to that. And it just didn't seem like it was a fun thing to do with the ripe old age of about 12 or 13. And uh, fast forward a couple of years, I started to develop this unbelievably 
uh, significant asthmatic response. Uh, completely non-allergenic, meaning that I didn't have a specific allergy that would trigger it. My body was just out of sync. And as a consequence of that, um, I was really failing, like in a very dramatic way. And there weren't many testing protocols. And that really brings up HRV as we go down a path here. There weren't many testing protocols other than going on the medical route. And I remember my pediatrician, because I was young enough to be under a pediatrician's care, looking at me, and you got to hear this. He said, you know, it seems that asthma turns to, you know, turns out in seven year cycles. And since you're 15, well, you know, I probably have about six more years of this kind of bad cycle you're in. And I'm thinking, wow, that's some real science, hmm. you know, looking at three times seven and, you know, minus uh, minus 15. And so uh, we happened to be attending a family function. And my uncle Bill, who was a dairy farmer, you know, in his, you know, his big boots and everything else, looks at my father, whose name was Charlie, and said, for gosh sake, Charlie, take that kid to a chiropractor. And my father took me back to my chiropractor. And you're going to love this, Dave. My chiropractor, who originally, who originally was looking at my bent spine, because that's the window that I came in, was actually trained himself by BJ Palmer. And when, yeah, and so when I now presented with a true, in his mind, chiropractic case, he started to care for me through a chiropractic lens, meaning he adjusted my nervous system, not my bent spine. And as a consequence of that, the intent and the direction of care that was, was done was, and we'll go into this, was focused on the vagal tone that had been missing. And as a consequence of that, I became a advocate at the ripe old age of 15 and 16 of a chiropractic experience. Uh, fast forward to the rationale of, you know, breaking a parent's heart when you choose chiropractic instead of medicine, you know, when you were organized around that one. Uh, I chose chiropractic over dentistry and medicine and otherwise because of that experience. And the last thing I'll say in that sort of focus model was the reason I did that was that I had learned in my undergraduate to, to understand logic. And logic was what I had been trained in in mathematics. And when I looked at this model that was based upon, you know, conjecture and symptomatology that was simply the pathogenic model, it was completely illogical from what I had experienced, which was how to tune the nervous system so that I could function at a higher level. Mm -hmm. And that's been my sort of lifelong quest after that. Um, and the last thing I'll say was it's been the most joyous journey not only having had that experience, but interfacing at a research level, interfacing at a clinical level and interfacing at this technological level with that very primal functional, you know, early experience, which was if you clean up the obstructions and rebalance the nervous system, remarkable things can happen outside of the medical model. And so nothing antagonistic to medicine, they just don't get it right all the time. Yes. Uh, wow. That is, uh, th that is such an awesome answer. Um, and, uh, and really cool to learn about, uh, about your history a little bit there too, how you, uh, how you came up and, uh, and, and that is, you know, it's so funny to hear uh, what you said that your, your chiropractor was originally treating you for what you came in with and yeah. then looked at you through a chiropractic lens. Um, and I think that a lot of us do get jaded in that, uh, when we're seeing patients, um, that we, we look at them and just look at the problem rather than looking at the, the greater, uh, you know, the, the greater issue that is at hand. Um, but but let me, let me interject for just a brief moment there. It, they do that. We do that. I'm not separating myself from that because it's, it's there. We do that because we care so deeply about people, people in absolutely. healthcare care deeply about helping others. And when you see somebody struggling with symptoms and otherwise, it's the first thing is to throw them a lifesaver, you know, is to throw them a, a life preserver to say, come on, I can help you. Mm -hmm. And the biggest help, and this is what we, we, we know, know using HRV, is the greatest lift that any human can give another human is the ability to adapt in a, in a, in a more complete way so that they can take care of their own health and maybe even manage their symptoms on a different path, but that they have foundational improvements that will last them a lifetime. And that's the whole joy of retuning this functional nervous system. 
That's awesome. Oh, so so I would love to hear, because it sounds like you got into the vagal nerve and everybody can take a drink if they want uh, uh, with, with, with our vagal nerve drinking game uh, uh, pretty <laughs> early on uh, in your journey. So, so I would just kind of like to hear when did sort of the the idea or your understanding, and I love your engineering background as well, because I'm sure this informs uh, with uh, some of your work, just your journey with, with heart rate variability, kind of having come across it, it sounds uh, fairly early on. Yeah, I think that we all sort of, you know, come out of the chiropractic school, if you would, understanding uh, the impact of neurology. Unfortunately, in many of the schools, they look at peripheral neurology. They look at, you know, you know, pain patterning and dysfunction from the IVF outward. I really, in the early days of my practice and even in neurology, don't forget, I've been in this game long enough that even the conceptual ideas didn't come true in terms of neuroplasticity and neurotransmitters being non-synaptic, like being, the, everybody knew neurotransmitters were non-synaptic, but the fact that they were so relevant in the non-synaptic way until like the late 90s. Yeah. And as a consequence of that, you know, this whole movement towards neuroplastic responsiveness, the understanding of the different neurotransmitters as they cascaded into the, into the functionality, started to be understood through Candace Pert's work and through there was a whole, you know, the whole cascade of, of wonderful research that was starting to bring chiropractic to the forefront, not because of its back pain modeling, but we started to recognize to look from the IVF inward. Mm -hmm. And and we started to not look at it in simply those states. So I would say, uh, Matt, that, that this, this organizational modeling towards higher levels of functional neurology began in probably the late 90s. And we started to really understand how to coordinate looking at you know, we all knew everything about EEG, when I say everything, we all knew about EEG, and we all knew about different functional things, but they weren't being applied in this salutogenic model, they were always in a pathogenic model. Mm -hmm. And so when we started to look at, at combining uh, sympathetic motor responses, looking at thermography, and we started to look at EMG, and I'm talking now, I was working in Boston University in research, and I was looking at, at modeling that was associated. So I have a, I have a fellowship in, 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 in high performance sports, in research and otherwise. And so we were looking at not trying to, to understand in the late 90s, how to fix back pain that was athletic therapists and other people's you know game we were interested in tuning to the nervous system so uh, i got connected with some amazing people who were looking at emg in that era and we started to look at studies not so much of looking at tight muscles but looking at motor neurology that was conflicted and as a consequence of that we you know this is how i came across dr kent and dr jen tempo is that we started and you can't stick your nose into high performance sports in the late 90s without dabbling in hrv uh you know the russian sports federation uh, I got invited to go over to Romania to to participate in looking at the Russian. I, I actually declined because things were kind of awkward in political situations about then with Ceausescu. But I got invited to go over there to try and organize some understanding about what was going on with this new facility, which was HRV. Mm. And HRV was really being used in those earliest of days long before cardiology actually but it was it was really primarily to look at recovery rates in athletes and this was the most fascinating thing that we could do well we translated that and started to look at the semg correlation to it and started to look at the at the thermographic end stage modeling that was happening in the sympathetic regional motor systems instead of this instead of this pan neurological experience of you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic balance, vagal tone, et cetera, et cetera. So long answer was that we came around 2006. I had become an academic advisor to CLA in about those late 90s. And Christopher Kent and myself especially started to have the conversations that were really directed at understanding how we could figure out how HRV could be used in a chiropractic setting to not worry so much about vagal tone, that comes a little later, but worry more about understanding if there was an adaptive reserve 
that could be drawn upon looking at this innate capacity to respond, react, and perform at the highest levels. And that means that we had to seek out some pretty cool people. And that's when we met Roland McCready from HeartMath. And so Roland McCready and Doc Chidre were our foundational partners in developing what we created, which was the Neuropulse. There you go, long answer. <laughs> so when did the Neuropulse come, uh, come to full conception? Uh, uh, it was named, it is being named the Impulse Wave Profiler, and I'll tell you why that is for in just a moment. Uh, it was originally part in about 2003, it was originally part of the creating wellness dialogue and we were creating a, we, we did a great job. This was such a cool thing. <laughs> we, we ended up doing a provocative HRV test. Okay. So we decided what we would do was we would monitor two other biometric statuses to understand their level of stability so we would monitor uh, finger temperature so that we could identify whether or not well first off if they had Raynaud's phenomenon to see if they were a good candidate for it but we would be tracking to the tenth of a degree any temperature shift which would be more of a sympathetic modeling that was going on but then we did something really cool is that we started to apply GSR and and GSR synonymously tracking it allows us could you, to could you define that real quick just in case people might not yeah yeah that. sorry so gsr is galvanic skin response thank you and it's skin conductance response if you're if you're looking at different papers so gsr stands for scr and one of the things that we started to do was understand to, to help other people it's a lie detector test it's very <laughs> simply it's checking out what's called the pseudomotor responsiveness yeah. and in an instant if somebody has a level of thought provoked arousal or anxiety, but let's just use it to arousal because anxiety tends to think that it's you know, conflicted. Arousal could be positive or negative. There is an instantaneous sympathetic responsiveness that allows them to through, check through their fingertips, the pseudomotor responses. And so we could collect HRV in the pulse wave profiler with two to live streaming other setups with the, with the temperature and the GSR and track the five minute window of time to see if they went into a arousal or sympathetic dominant state while we were collecting it. And if we did, we dismissed the test. And if we didn't, we knew that we had a very calm or at rest setting that was going to happen. And that became really critical, especially when we wanted to look at the data in sequential modeling that was going in a chiropractic setting, not on a day by day basis, but on a fractal of time window basis that would be say 12 visits, you know, six weeks, four weeks, whatever else. And, and there's problems with that, but at least we had the standardized testing protocols to limit the variance. That I, uh, so that was so amazing. And I do want to say, um, I, you know, you you are a large reason why I got so deep into this uh, into this HRV stuff, um, and I uh, and I was fortunate enough to be brought up into chiropractic uh, with with chiropractors who used uh, CLA equipment. Um, so I was introduced to all of this uh, at a very young age, uh, a very very young within uh, within chiropractic. Actually, when I was just a chiropractic assistant when I was like eighteen or nineteen, mm -hmm. um, and I. Uh, and seeing all of that got me so intrigued. And, and, uh, and also, you know, I, I did send Matt like the graphs and the outputs uh, that uh, cool. had come along. Um, and they're uh, just so motivating for patients too, I do have to say. Um, but hearing, uh, hearing your explanations for, for heart rate variability, hearing, your, uh, hearing how this all fits together uh, is just so extremely powerful. I, you can't help but get amped up about it. And I, you know, I see Matt over there going, yes, <laughs> uh, as, as well. But, um, but this, is just, uh, this is just so amazing. Um, so with, um, with that, uh, tell us, uh, can you tell us more about how, how that starts to get applied in practice? And I'd be more, to, and I'd be more than happy to talk about how I use it in practice as well, um, but, uh, but how you apply that with patients. 
Well, I th yeah, I'd love to. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I, I introduced the term in this early conversation about neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that there's this adaptive urge, if you would, within the human experience to reorganize to the higher levels of efficiency. And to do that, you have to have this, this, this capability of reserve within the autonomic responsiveness. It, it can't be drained and it can't be it can't be sympathetic dominant all the time, or it's just going to, to, to wear the systems out. And we know that we know through our studies, for instance, that when you start to live in a sympathetic dominant state, the body has to respond to that, not just in the autonomic nervous system, but it, it has to posturalize that response. Meaning that you start to get functional shifts in neurology that show up in functional position modeling in the body. The body is constantly on guard and this then starts to erode or, or use more and more energetics, it's very expensive to be physically out of balance. Mm -hmm. um, it, when, you, when you take a very complex system like the locomotor system in our body and the constant drag of gravity coming down into it, it becomes incredibly expensive to neurology to try and fight against gravity. I mean, just try and imagine that you take, uh, you know, a, a, a two gallon gas can and hold it away from your body and hold it into your body. The difference in the energy you expend is exhausting. And then start to imagine that your, you know, your head is a bowling ball. And now all of a sudden that it's holding itself out of the axial loading properties of the spine. It's, it's fighting itself in a flex position. These contribute to this constant overriding of that, of that sympathetic parasympathetic balance. And so this constant exhaustion drives the body to be more sympathetic dominant. And it isn't so much that it's sympathetic dominant, it becomes parasympathetic insufficient. And we all know that. And so here's one of the great things that we started to realize as we introduced it into the clinical practice was, and Zhang did this study in, in about that 06 time, and he was working out of the Logan School. And the Zhang study said, Hmm. If we're looking at the SDNN relationships as, you know, using as the calculatory model, what if we gave one adjustment, not one, not one in sequence of others or whatever else, could we see that the SDNN was affected by that? This was the earliest days of chiropractic, and they used the term manipulations at that time to try and identify if a spinal manipulation was associated with it. And we were like, well, catch up. We've been seeing this since 03, 04, you know, in the modeling, but he published on that. And then he went through two other sequences is that they put them in a sequence and then he looked at it a year later from those same people and they had differentials in to the betterment of the SDNN being more highly variable and they had higher HRV. When we started to take a look in, in our cohorts of people, and this is where it gets really cool. Like that was cool that we knew that a, a visit based model was there. But when chiropractors put together a care plan and we could assess them outside of chiropractic modeling of SEMG and thermal, but we put, we asked a cohort of our CLA clients to assess the patient using their on table assessments, could be leg links, could be x-ray, could be whatever else, but then include EMG and thermography and HRV. Could we determine whether or not these people were in what we would determine is a well-adjusted state or a not well-adjusted state? And so we, we did 2,468 scans of the nervous system through this cohort that was there. And we got the scatter plots that showed us through their HRV scatter plots, this distinction of what would, in this group that was quote unquote well-adjusted of where their ranges would be in HRV, both in the balance between the autonomics, as well as the amount of horsepower or the amount of activity that was in that, that region. And we were able to grab them because there were so many different published, you know, published uh, ranges that we could go against in the public domain of unadjusted people. You know, those were there. And then we had this chiropractic cohort of not just patients of chiropractors, but patients that deemed to be well adjusted. And that's where you saw, I think, Matt and David, you know about it, is that rainbow graph that we created. Mm -hmm. That rainbow graph is pure genius for a chiropractor because it makes the understanding and the plotting of it so easy to report from. But the realities were, and here was the, the most interesting part, was that 
by attending a chiropractor, which Zhang showed, you got a boost in HRV. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when we continue to use chiropractic and you were deemed to be well adjusted, your level of activity and balance within the central functioning autonomic nervous system was significantly different than the public as they would be determined by just general HRV. Mm -hmm. So we could set a trajectory for with, with predictive outcomes. We knew now we now knew a range of well-adjusted nervous systems so that the chiropractor could set predictive outcomes associated with HRV to associate with the care modeling that they were doing. And and yeah, I mean, we have thousands of clients doing this and I think about 5% of them actually get that. <laughs> but it is, the, it is the greatest tool that you can associate for predictive outcomes. And, and I'll say in a chiropractic model, but in any model, we're talking psychologists here, we're talking to you know, anybody else. If you are doing your job, in terms of, you know, whether it's, whether it's communicating a positive approach, we all know this, whether you're communicating a positive approach, you're going to shift the tonality within the nervous system. But if you do it sequentially so that it, it becomes resilient in its outcomes, then you've changed not only the function of that person for the moment, but you have set new habituation within the functioning nervous system. And what we're learning now using EEG studies, Heidi Havik's work, et cetera, is that it's associated with prefrontal cortex canalization. And so this diaschesis that associates between cerebellar and prefrontal cortex functionality is most likely going to be shown that when you have a well-adjusted nervous system, this, this hemisphericity as well as this front to back relationship between the forebrain and the rear brain is going to be so much more vivid and locked in. These are what the exciting times are. That, just mind blowing. So yeah. I, I've got to ask you from, because my, my background is in mental health. Um, you, you, you started to touch on this, but I would love to kind of just ask uh, something really concrete is, you know, in mental health, we have not, and I'm hoping HRV can start to change this conversation. Uh, we've not talked about things like diet, movement, uh, sleep, those sort of things, much less adjustment to being, having a well-adjusted yeah. physical body. I mean, it just has not been, I think heart rate variability, I hope will inject this in of what improves HRV is going to result typically in at least improvements in mood and mental health. So I wonder if somebody who's, it sounds like, like Dave uh, has this holistic focus, where does psychology sort of come into play? Because we talk about adjusted, well-adjusted, well-adjusted as well. So I'd love to just get your, your, maybe dig a little deeper into that since you already sort of gave us that, the foundation. Yeah, I think that it's it's really important to understand that, you know, if we if we look, and I'm not here to promote chiropractic, I'm here to promote good choice, you know, for where it's at. And chiropractic is an excellent choice. Um, but here's the here's the reason why. And and if we were to look at a uh, at a hierarchical process, we would we would see that, you know, in a classic, a classic triangular hierarchy that's going up. We would take a look and sort of say, if we want to express our humanness, whether it's through movement or whether it's through, uh, you know, uh, mental acuity or whether it's through emotional tone or whether it's through performance in an athletic responsiveness, our foundational element, the biggest component should be our neural adaptability. That should be our absolute foundation because no matter how you slice it and dice we live our entire lives through the functioning nervous system. Mm -hmm. okay? So it makes sense that if you have a tool so well-researched in not only the pathogenic models, but in the salutogenic models, if you have a tool like HRV, then that seems to be a foundational element as a starting point and a tracking mechanism to understand how people are participating in this co-relationship between their choices and their ability to maintain 
a state of coherence, you know, a classic Antonovsky SOC, right? Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. You take a look, and this is good. I've, I've got some really cool things for, for your listeners to hear because I work with some amazing data scientists and the amazing data scientists are very connected through universities and otherwise. But I got a call from one of my guys and he said, hey, David, I got some great news for you. When we take a look on a world scale uh, and we take a look at the 7 billion people on the world, on the world scale and look at their, their, the sort of uh, understanding of HRV, it seems to have tipped that critical point of 16% of population knowing and using HRV on a, on a progressive basis. Mm. And we sort of went, oh, okay. And he said, you should be so proud of yourself that you, you know, were the early adopter of this whole principle because uh, the world caught up to you. And I said, okay, well, that's very cool. But here's the, here's the bottom line was that um, if we have this, if we have now the world interested in HRV, and now we can start to educate them that before they have to look at the other hierarchical principles, which might be, might be the ability of structure, might be the second level up. I'm not suggesting that this is, this is, is limited to this, and fuel or dietary habituation must be there. I put structure below or, or more foundational than, say, fuel, because we live in gravity. You can't, you can't get away from it. You have to have position and motion for exactly as I was saying, it's going to be a huge drain on your nervous system, but let's face it. The biochemistry of the world we're in certainly is maximal problematic in terms of the whole thing. But if we build this triad very simply, and Dave, you'll understand this of, of thoughts, you know, traumas and toxins in terms of the, the, the dimensions of where they are, we start to recognize that our mental health and mental acuity is tied directly, directly to our state of coherence, is, to, is, is the fact that if we are incoherent in our structure, if we, are, if we are constantly cheating in our biochemistry, whether it's toxins in the environment, toxins in what we take in, you can't get away from it. It impacts the functioning nervous system. So if you come up with a sweet tool, and I know you guys use biofeedback and that's a sweet tool. If you come up with a sweet tool like biofeedback or a chiropractic adjustment that improves the coherence of the functioning nervous system, and then you've got gold. And I don't mean dollar gold. I'm talking about currency in human health and performance that is, that is undeniable. And so, you know, when I take a look at, at, at the reason I fall in love with chiropractic, it isn't simply because it works, is that you figure out every day why it works. And, you know, if you take a look at some of the great chiropractic adjustive care models, they have focused on the parasympathetic inputs that are affiliated with the way that the human, you know, the, that the human um, uh, uh, wiring harness is designed. And so when we take a look at the structure as it relates to function, the upper cervical is greatly influencing the vagal tone of anybody. We know that. But we don't deny the fact that below the diaphragm, the, the parasympathetic tonality is associated with sacral neurology. And so you take a look at the great chiropractic models that are salutogenic by basis, and they focus on re-engaging, reducing the stressors, increasing the tonality of the, set of the sacral inputs and the upper cervical inputs. And that's the skill of a chiropractor to understand how to associate those with the benefit and the rationale behind it, Matt, especially, that you can look at all dimensions of humanness, mm -hmm. whether they are physical, physical activities or socialization. I mean, look at Porges' work that was associated with socialization and HRV and look at the work that's affiliated primarily with, with, with just understanding that people can't, they can't see their perspective of the world without it being tainted if they're looking through a lens of a conflicted nervous system. They just can't. And so the world would be a better place. I mean, in the earliest days, D.D. Palmer, who was one of the founders of chiropractic, said we could empty the jails if people understood chiropractic. And, and uh, he wasn't talking about fixing, you know, bent spines. 
he was talking about shifting the t- shifting the perspective of human beings by cleaning up the obstructions in their nervous system. Long time ago, but here we are. And if I and if I can follow up uh, on that as well, um, you know, it, Matt, in regards to what what you had said too, uh, in your question, is oh, the the beauty of this in conjunction with other therapies too, like. Uh, mm-hmm. It, you know, like like you were asking about psychology, I get to see this uh, daily in action with uh, with speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, as we have at our clinics as well. Is that when when a nervous system is fully regulated, right? Which is uh, which is something that we get to use our tool of chiropractic to to do. I, we see these other therapies. We see this person just explode. We see we see the capabilities, the adaptability, right, of this person just go through the roof. Um, and that is just so cool and so powerful and, and a hundred percent, right. Because, because their whole person, their whole miss, um, has just raised up a level. Um, so we, we absolutely love that. And, and Dr. David, I I cannot thank you enough for, uh, for that awesome answer (laughs) for all of your awesome answers thus far. There's a book title in there about, uh, uh, something about the lens that I'll have to go back and listen. Uh, <laughs> I, I, do, I don't know how much more time we have, but let me share, if, if I do have time, let me share. Please do, more. please do. Yeah. Um, because I think it really, really leans into this behavioral modeling that's happening. I think because of, because of this fascinating interest, this hierarchical model that I sort of discussed there, um, Chiropractic started to open up uh, again through the lenses of this, this modeling that CLA really promoted. Uh, it's, it's using the principles that were there in chiropractic, but adding this technology modeling. And it started to open up the whole use of chiropractic to be non-spinal associated, especially with children, as they were having behavioral model, behavioral issues. Um, you know, and, and so there's this tremendous push within chiropractic right now to use HRV to understand um, the behavioral modeling that is associated with, you know, kids on the spectrum or ADD, ADHD that's in the whole, mo- that's in there, but then introducing chiropractic as a foundational element, not as a treatment format, but to set the tone right so that when these children need to go to the next level in that hierarchical modeling that I'm talking about, where for instance, you know, visual acuity fields might be associated, that we start to see that that we may be maybe working with an occupational therapist who's working towards this modeling. Mm -hmm. This does not diminish the fact that, you know, I don't want to in my world try and treat children when they have the ability to be cared for. But when I go to adjust a child, my goal is to set them on the path that others can then elevate their experience. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to take my foot off the pedal. I'm going to be with that that child or that modeling here and after. But what's fascinating when you start to look at these cohorts of kids that come in and they have, you know, parents are wonderful because they'll do anything to get their child back on track. And so by the time many times they're coming to see a chiropractor, they've expended a lot of their energy and time and money and otherwise going through a very traditional, hopefully non-drug based intervention with these spectral kids. And so they come in already running in the same path as us. But as soon as we start to tune their nervous system, it's almost this, this, this exceptional leap of improvement that's coming in. So we develop two peripheral sensors that associate with our, our, our desktop element, which is the pulse wave profiler, because the children's hands are too, too small. So we started to put on ear clips and finger sleeves. And the data collection on those is very, very good. You, you know that. They're sort of the equivalent of polar chest strapping. And one of the other things that we do on our end is that you, you must be familiar with the Kubios uh, uh, associated you know, uh, algorithms. Long before Kubios came into it, we had created our own algorithms with our data scientists, which fascinatingly were looking at these ectopic beat patterns. And we were able to, to do some snipping processes to remove them like Kubios does, to try and get a very, very distinctive spring without altering the relationship of that whole model. And, and that kind of brings up the fact that in that 16% of people, this is very exciting because people are generally interested in their 
state, but they don't understand coherence. So they start using WHOOP, they start using Elite HRV and all the rest of it. And that's good. You know, I mean, it, it, it moves it up, but it's not clinical grade because they, they when you take a look at the different algorithms that, that are used to snip that data, and we, we took a look at eight of them. Uh, we, we got in the back end of eight of those more capable um, app driven ones. And when you take a look at the data, the data washing that goes on behind the scenes, it's because you can't control the data streams for three minutes or five minutes. Mm -hmm. Now we started out with a five minute collection, which was the 1996 heart pacing gold standard. And we found that in our world, three minutes in our, in our modeling, because that's a pathology model. That's looking at the cardiology basis of heart pacing. And so we were able to determine that the three minute collection in that quieted state gave exactly the synonymous benefit of a five minute collection. But, and you can still do it under two minutes if you have a really stable collection model. But you start collecting way under three minutes, then you start to get an awful lot of those algorithms cheating back. It's just the, the nature of math. You just need an awful lot of inputs, which is how AI works and machine learning works. Mm -hmm. The bigger the tranche of data, the more accurate and more interesting the data pool gets. So I think that we really can take a look at this behavior modeling and come to a, a couple of very, very interesting conclusions with it. Now, I got a chance to work with Ned Hallowell, who was the one who originated the whole modeling of ADD, ADHD in the clinical practice. He only sold about two and a half, three million books. And, and so he adopted, we actually created a program which was called Shine, which associated with, with, the, uh, with his expertise in from Boston Mass and chiropractic. And we started to see that exactly what we intended was going to come about. And that was that if people got their nervous systems, that again, triangular hierarchy, then every intervention beyond that accelerated the improvement of this child. Mm -hmm. So if they could work with a collaborative relationship with a brain-based functional neurologist, that was good, but it was better if we got them in the hands of somebody like yourself, Matt, who would be a psychologist who understood how to bring out the humanness in that child while their nervous system was reprogramming. It's amazing the limits. And you know what? As dedicated as Ned Hallowell was to the was to, to the pharmacological modeling, because that was his windows, you know, yeah. to do it, he was so wide open to watching the improvements of this incredible intervention that didn't include pharmacological models. And it, that was what made us feel so good about working with him is that he had a lot of flexibility. And we also knew that there are terrible cases that that aren't ready for our care. And you didn't have to, you didn't have to disassociate yourself from even the worst cases when you were working with even a very qualified medical practitioner that had a, that had a very open perspective. So, and again, HRV was the basis of what we were doing. Awesome. So I feel like I have like 30 questions uh, to follow up, but I'm going to, I'm going to sort of pick my favorite and let Dave ask one towards, uh, I'll give him one left here, but um, I want to give you a long runway for this one because I can't wait to hear uh, your thoughts. As being a pioneer, uh, I was, you know, I only came to heart rate variability five years ago and then was sort of quickly appalled that the mental health folks like me were not in general talking about this. I don't know if we've hit 6% yet in mental health, though I'm doing everything in my power uh, to try to get us there because I, I think everything you've said we need to consider in our work as well. So I, I want to ask kind of a, a two-part question, though very related. Um, one is just kind of my angst is, with your experience, when the hell is the, uh, uh, I guess, the medical model field, if there's not a better word, but your MDs, especially uh, traditional healthcare settings, for lack of a better word, where are they going to get this, in your opinion? Because I think what, what you said is just so needed in all of healthcare, whether we're talking mental health, chiropractic, I, you know, my whole philosophy of human beings got changed by working with great occupational uh, therapists. And as part of that question, as somebody who's had these now decades of experience uh, with this, 
where do you see this going with our technology evolving and we're getting to this threshold? So I, lo I love to throw the medical angst that I have um, into that uh, question, if, I, if you could allow me uh, to throw a little angst in there. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great observation and a great question. And I think we all, you know, all of us in healthcare, especially those of us who have an influential voice in healthcare, are fascinated to look at the last two years mm -hmm. that, have, uh, that have really challenged the status quo of what's gone on. And if we can take a look at, at the most interesting statistics I can share with you, but I think everybody knows this on this podcast is that what happened was that the individual person became empowered during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I know that is the antithesis of what we see because we were sort of driven around by public health decisions. I'm in Canada. We got kind of hammered badly with being told what to do. But what has happened is that people have taken the mask off of this delusional perspective that medicine has all the answers. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this distinction between a, between a pathogenic model and a, and, a, and a salutogenic model. And if we study Antonovsky's work and we take a look at what his principles are, he distinguishes between the two by saying that salutogenesis is a stress-related responsiveness within the body. Mm -hmm. And people got it. They kind of went and said, well, if that's the best you can do. If that's the best you can do is stick something in my arm and pretend that artificial immunity is way better. And, and then, you know, Omicron comes along and it's like, oh, well, you know, like in our jurisdiction, they were really pushing the fourth booster, you know, on this whole thing. And the public finally said, go blow. Like, <laughs> we're done with you. You know, we, we, we're, we're happy that we've got what it takes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, and I'm not, this is not about vaccines or not vaccines. This is about the public taking a stance for their own personal health. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that to answer that question, where is medicine on this? I think they're reeling. I think that they're reeling to see the loss of control mechanisms that they've had. I can tell you statistically, and I think this is really important for your listeners to hear, we have thousands of office and providers all throughout the world, 26 different countries in, uh, that we provide our, our HRV to. And so we get data every day because we have a cloud-based uh, model system that goes along with it. And the people that adhere to our modeling in terms of just what we've talked about the whole trip here and use our technologies, we can track, we can track patient flow. And so in patient flow, we get initial exams, progress exams, and comparative exams. So we can watch two things. We can watch progressions as in what the data says, but we can also just look at the sheer numbers of new patients and progressions and retention that goes along. Mm. It has been a hockey stick since about June, we're in June now, but since about June of 2020. So we've had about a two year hockey stick of where the practices, despite all the interventions that went on, have been seeing more new patients and have been patients that stay longer because mm. the message of self-care has become so important for the average person. And so I think to answer your question, I think medicine has got to get it right. They're very, very capable at understanding HRV to understand its ability to look at cardiac dysfunction and to even look at psychological distress. But they don't know what to do other than to tell somebody to meditate mm -hmm. and take an anxiolytic. And that's about as much as they can do. And it's embarrassing to know that there's such a vivid corpus of knowledge that we all can access. You know, any one of us can go on PubMed and see the 40,000 different HRV studies that tell you exactly the same thing with every one of them, <laughs> is do some deep breathing, have a happy moment, eat less fats and oils, unless you love them, and just be you, and you're going to live a longer, healthier, and happier life. That's what HRV tells us. And um, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you one more story as you're doing this medical modeling. So do you know Yori Gidron? Does anybody know Yori's work? And in, in, so he's from, from Tel Aviv originally. He was actually taught under Antonovsky, but Yori and I are very close friends and we've done a tremendous amount of work together. 
And Yori is a, is a research scientist in HRV or utilizing HRV. And he, uh, interestingly, his background is in psychoneuroimmunology. And, he, and so Yori uh, writes this seminal paper back about 2013, 2014. And he goes and he looks at retrospective studies of stage four colon cancer patients. And in that cohort of, of stage four, there's a very rapid death. And so prognosis in, in stage four is based upon pathogenic markers. And so it's very well known, you know, in, in different biometrics of this thing. And he goes, hmm, let me see if they had any HRV studies that were done along there. And what he published on was the fact that those other biomarkers were completely irrelevant when it came to looking at the prognosis and the length of life of these other ones. The only stable factor of looking at the prognosis and the quality of life, but the length of life, senescence of those same patients who were bound to die because of stage four colon cancer was HRV. Mm. And he rewrote the entire model of saying, if you know HRV in a medical world, that should have shook everybody up in medicine the, to answer your question no one picked up on that except chiropractors yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, well dave i will let i'll let you uh, uh kind of wrap us up here if you have any uh, i i feel like i said i'll hold off on 29 other questions uh in case you have one uh you want to wrap up on uh, that's uh, I, I have an entire list that I've jotted <laughs> down as we've been going to um, and uh, and uh, obviously we're at the top of the hour so I want to respect everybody's time uh, but I uh, Dr. Fletcher I do want to ask um, I, the other day we had chatted and uh, and you had mentioned about the volume of of HRV data that your company gets and yeah. That it was quite astounding to me. Um, and, and again, I know that you've been in the game for a long time. I know that uh, CLA has been around for, for a while, but um, just so our listeners can understand uh, where you're coming from on all this, uh, can, are you open to sharing? Some oh, yeah. Of the, uh, you know, it, it, it through an inspiring perspective. Um, and so without trying to sort of um, I mean, people wouldn't really understand sheer numbers of, of, of data sets that go along with it. But on an average, we process uh, somewhere around four and a half to five million HRV scans uh, on a yearly basis. And, uh, you know, the the relationship that we have and, and and that's growing rapidly, you know, as we go around there. And two reasons. One, like we said more people are coming to chiropractors than ever before. So the number of data sets that are coming in from each chiropractor increases, but we're also catching the attention of many, many chiropractors. And so we're very much a popular, um, popular product, if you will, for that, for, for an examination tool. But the most important thing about that is that when, and, and I think most of your listeners understand that the greatest thing that's happening in mathematics and in organizational modeling of complex systems is AI. And AI is, is, through machine learning and AI, is fascinating to be able to finally, instead of ask questions to then have the very traditional, you know, scientific model, which is to put a hypothesis up and try and see if you can prove your hypothesis right or wrong and go the other way, AI takes it in a different direction. And it says, hey, let me take a look at massive data pools and see if there's, you know, in, in, the, in our world, we refer to it as the pony in the pile. And I won't go into that too much, but what pops? What are some of the spikes and interesting things that are there? So instead of necessarily asking a big first question called a hypothesis, we can actually say, what does the data tell us? And once we start to have a, a breadcrumb of a path under which we can then start to follow, we can start to ask different layers. And so AI and machine learning works in layering, but to begin that, you use the data to see what pops. And so we're fascinated to know a couple of things in our world. We want to know how, in, and, and the whole world, my daughter works with Microsoft. And as a consequence of that, and she's on a world team, their entire team is focused on predictive outcomes. And, in, and, and that's not even in healthcare. In our world, I think that the holy grail is on predictive outcomes using AI modeling. And you can't do that unless you have data tranches that are massive. We just happen to have the largest data tranche 
and we'll, I keep going back to the term, but of salutogenic based data that is ever being collected. It, and, and so I think that we have the ability to literally shift the perception of how data researchers, how clinicians, how, how scientists who understand vagal tone and coherence are going to be able to have the next level of predictive outcomes just, Dave, because of that data trumps that we've been dedicated to collecting. Yeah, that is just wow. a, <laughs> unbelievable, the volume uh, and, yeah. and, and the ability. Like that's a, your mind starts going crazy with, uh, with the things that you can pull from that. Um, and then, uh, you know, like you said, you get AI going on that it gets um, even beyond what your, what your wildest dreams could imagine. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, the, the hardest time we have is finding data scientists. They're about the busiest people on the planet these yeah, days. Yeah. But uh, well I live paid in, nowadays too, from what I hear. Oh yeah. Well, I live in <laughs> Toronto, and Toronto is deemed the um, deemed the AI capital of the world right now. Um, and uh, and so it's it's a very topical conversation. But like you said, Matt, you can't find anybody. Yeah. <laughs> it, no matter how much you pay them, they're, they're, they're uh, very popular. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Fletcher, I, I want to thank you so very much uh, for, for your time and sharing uh, your journey. I, like I said, I, there's so much there that I just want to re-listen to this and unpack it. But I, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, I know I speak for uh, our Dr. Dave as well is uh, please feel free to come nerd out with us uh, anytime because uh, <laughs> This was great. And like I said, I'll, I'll keep my uh, 29 additional follow up. I think you gave me like six or seven more just within that last few minutes there. Uh, uh, for another time, you might be able to join us. But I want to I want to thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, let's just, I'll put uh, your bio and con website information and stuff. But if people are just driving in their car, not, they're not show notes. People might. What would be a, a good maybe web address or somewhere where sure. they can find you online? Actually, I was thinking about that. So I think that, um, and Dave, I'll get you the link for this specifically, but I wrote an ebook that was the clinic, the application of HRV in clinical practice. And it's a very simplistic, easy reading, you know, one dedicated to that. You can go to our website at insightcla.com. And if you just go to the resources section, you can go and do the drop down and choose that ebook. It's obviously there for, for anybody to get. Um, and uh, I think that since this is an HRV podcast, it's important to sort of get a window into where our world and journey have taken us a bit. But um, I think that one of the most exciting things that I can share to, you know, chiropractors who are listening, but non-chiropractors who are listening, chiropractic is not the same as, I mean, it's finally, it's finally adhering to the, to the vision that it had a long time ago. Uh, I always refer to it as chiropractic as it is meant to be. The truth and reality is that um, chiropractic is all about neuroplastic responsiveness. And for 125 years, we've been dedicating ourselves to try and figure out in the most protected and, and I would say um, safe way, how you can re-engage vagal tone. And uh, I think that uh, I think that uh, we have to erase a lot of misconceptions about chiropractic in the public domain. But I urge everyone to seek out a chiropractor who is engaged in the type of work that the three of us are talking about, because without chiropractic and this is just simply I'm not trying to promote chiropractic or otherwise. It just seems when I read every paper on everything about HRV, especially it just seems that when you adjust the tone in the nervous system through a chiropractic lens of that adjustment is that the stickiness of the improvement is better than anything else on the planet. And I, I don't ask me why we haven't figured that one out yet. I could postulate on it a whole bunch, but it just seems that that interaction between structure and function and tonality and, and, and dentate ligament associated stuff is got something everyone should explore. So I wish you all a good exploration. Sounds good. Well, I got to jump off oh, yeah. here because I got to make a chiropractic appointment. So yeah, uh, and please you, do. You sold me a million <laughs> times over, but thank you so much. Um, and like I said, uh, optimalhrv.com uh, for the show notes and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Thanks all. Bye-bye.